Good morning, everyone. That's a little weak compared to your energy last night. Uh, we will not be doing a full-on pep rally and make you cheer, go Bears, go Bears. Maybe a little go Olin at the end, but we're, uh, we're really excited to have you here and be with you this morning at our dean's meeting. Uh, my name is Steve Malter. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Undergraduate and Graduate Programs, and uh, really want to welcome you to the Olin community, welcome you this morning. Uh, we have several speakers for you this morning to give you some information about Olin, and then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Our first speaker this morning is our Dean, Mark Taylor. Dean Taylor has been at Olin since December of 2016. He has had an incredibly distinguished career, both in academia and in corporate America. He is one of the most highly cited financial economists. He has had teaching stints at NYU, at Oxford. He has been Dean of the Warwick Business School in the UK. And that was his last academic position before coming here to Olin. He has also worked for the Bank of England, the IMF, and run a hedge fund for BlackRock. So as you can see, Dean Taylor has had an incredibly distinguished career both in and out of the academy. And in addition to being the leader and having the vision and inspiring us in his, his years here, he's also started a wonderful tra tradition that he will give the first academic lecture to your students tomorrow morning. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our Dean, Mark Taylor. Thanks, Steve. Thank you and good morning and welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, let me first start by congratulating you, the parents, family of the great students that you're sending us here to join our Olin community. We have um, a BSBA students. We have um, the new joint program in, in uh, engineering, in computing science and business. And we also have our new Beyond Boundaries program. So welcome. All of those programs are highly competitive to get into, right? These are, so your students are amongst uh, the best in the world, to be frank, right? The best in the, in nationally. Uh, I can have some international experience. I can tell you they're amongst the best in the very, very world. There is no, there is no better. So congratulations to you providing that nurturing environment to, uh, to allow your students uh, to come to this great institution. As Steve said, I've been dean here for um, about two and a half, coming up to three years now. Uh, you, you probably you would never guess this, but I'm actually not from the United States originally. Uh, I'm actually from, from the UK. Although, I have, as Steve said, I've spent a big chunk of my time in America living in Washington, D.C., and San Francisco, and New York. Uh, and I can honestly say, out of all those places I've lived in the United States, I prefer to live in St. Louis. I actually really adore uh, this town. I very much like uh, the Midwest. I love this strong Midwestern culture we have here, which spills over in many ways into our, into our programs, <clears throat> into what we do at the school, although it doesn't stop us being uh, an international, having an international school, having a truly global reach. During the last couple of years, we, the first thing we did when I came here was to develop a new strategy for the school uh, and think about you know, what we were doing well. And the BSBA program, undergraduate program, was one thing we're doing well, but we need to innovate, perhaps, things, ways we can, we can improve. And things we weren't doing so well, things we could change and move forward, right? Because I firmly believe no matter how good you are, unless you're aiming to move up, you're moving down because the world is changing. Your competitors, your comparator schools are changing. The students are changing that are coming into the schools. So we're constantly innovating, thinking about that state of flux in which the school and the world is. The, um, we formed a new vision for the school, which is to provide world-changing business education research and impacts. It's the same. These are the three things we do business education, producing world-class leaders that are able to solve complex problems, think on a global scale, think entrepreneurially, no matter what the size or location of their organization is, to produce world-changing uh, research that has an impact on business, government, society. And what's more, that those three elements, business education, research, and impact, are not, are not, uh, they're not in silos. Right? Your students will be taught by gifted teachers. They will also be taught by some of the world leaders in the subjects in which they are being instructed. And that interface between research and teaching will uh, constantly keep um, what we're doing uh, at the cutting edge. And we have an emphasis on uh, actually your students' uh, research being done at an undergraduate level. So your students will be able to participate even in their first four years of their university career, if they, regardless of whether they decide to go and do graduate work, in, in, in participating in that research community. That's our vision. 
One thing that didn't change, one thing that was here when I came into, um, into Olin to have my interview, uh, which actually was very thoughtfully on um, Shakespeare's birthday. It was on uh, April the 23rd, 2016, which is actually the 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare, uh, as well as his birth. He died and born on the same date. Uh, and one thing that hasn't changed since then was those, uh, those, those banners that are hanging in the Frick Forum directly above us, which talk about our values. Integrity, collaboration, diversity, leadership, excellence. Because those values have been the values of the school since uh, 1917, right? Just over 100 years ago when this school was founded as one of the oldest business schools in the United States, indeed in the world. And those leadership, uh, integrity, collaboration, excellence, diversity values are part of what we do, right? So tomorrow when I speak uh, to your students and I give that first academic lecture, I'll spend some time uh, it will be a proper academic lecture. I'm going to talk about international financial capital flows, a little bit about my experience, about, I think, in a global perspective, and how that impacts uh, the United States and the rest of the world. But I will also talk about our values and what, what it means to be a WashU student, what it means to be an Olin student, right? We talk about being uh, values-based, data-driven. Okay, and that's true. It's true of uh, our researchers here. If you, if you analyze what we do in the school, it's a very, very um, analytic database school. Right? If you look at our marketing department, in many schools, the marketing department will be very, um, very, uh, so, you know, sort of, not necessarily the softer, but the, you know, the, the less quantitative end of psychology and organizational behavior. Here, it's very, very quantitative. Right? Lots and lots of data analyzing, getting results back from what the market is doing. We have um, a whole um, research center in data analytics. Right, which analyzes big data, looking at how that affects the market, looking at how big data, how you can get big data in financial markets and what drives financial markets, fintech and so forth. So that data-driven part is part of what we do in our research. But the values-based analysis is also part of what we do. We have another leadership, we have another center, uh, the Bauer Leadership Center for Values-Based Leadership. Um, and there we think about how we can bring those two elements together. Right? We analyze the data. We apply all our rigorous analytic techniques. And then before we make a decision, we pause and think, how does that interact with something that we don't have data on? We have our own internal data, our value system, values of our society, of our world, and my own personal values. Right? So being values-based and data-driven is, is very, very important. And thinking about what those values are. Integrity, collaboration, leadership, diversity, excellence. I will also say to your students, at one point I will say, uh, and you should, please don't tip them off about this. I'll say, uh, I want you to look around the room. Let's take 10 seconds, 15 seconds maybe, and look at the other people in this room right now. And I'm asking you to do this for two reasons. One is that I want you to think back on this day in 10 years' time and think where those people are, because I have no doubt that the leaders of tomorrow are sitting right here in this room, right? Top C-suite executives, leaders of NGOs, leaders of fantastically successful startups are right here, right now. And I want you to think back, oh yeah, she was doing that, she's doing that now, I'm doing this, right? But I also want you to look around and look at these people because you are looking at your collaborators. Right? These are not your competitors, these are your collaborators. These are the people that will be with you here to support, with you, support you for the next four years, right? And beyond, as you go out and join our uh, alumni community of over 30,000 alumni around the world. We are here for you. You are here for one another, right? And that is not just a little bit of emotive language. Um, we had, there are very, very good schools that we compete with, our comparator schools, where that would not be true, right? Where it's basically a very, very competitive environment. Some schools pride themselves on having this very, very competitive environment. We like to think of ourselves as being collaborative, collaboratively competitive, right? The way I put it is, you know, I would not want to be up against any of these guys in the market, but I'd want any one of them on my team, right? And that's very, very important to us. And that's really just, you know, we had a new strategy we developed over the last couple of years and began to implement, but part of that strategy was to build on what we're very, very strong at, and that is that, that strong values, those, those five values which encapsulate um, our value system, which are, as I say, hanging in the atrium right above us. Some of the other things we've done over the last couple of years are 
think about ways we can, we can reach out across the university, think about crossing boundaries, uh, collaborating with the university on that new program, think about our new, um, our new BS with uh, computing science, reaching out, crossing boundaries in that way. Um, when the, uh, the provost last night said, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're studying business, you should think about studying Shakespeare as well, I think that was a little, a little in-joke, if you like, which you're now insiders, right? Here's the circle, you're now in with us. Uh, Little in joke, I have a strong, I have a strong interest in, in Shakespeare. In fact, I was born, incidentally, about five miles from where Shakespeare was born. Uh, and every year we have a uh, we have a, 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 a Shakespeare festival here in the business school, round about uh, April 23rd. In fact, um, <laughs> and in fact, yeah, your your students, if they're if they're so interested, can participate in that. Is there is we don't hold auditions; people just show up, right? Uh, doesn't matter about ability, we'll get you through, right? And the, the plays are simplified and brought down to, to small vignettes, right? It's not a you know, three hour long King Lear, completely with beard and everything, it's just you know, small uh, plays. I, I often play a part. Uh, I think so far I've actually played King Lear, uh, the Duke in Romeo and Juliet, and uh, they keep casting me in these kind of remote authoritarian figures. I have no <laughs> idea why, right? That's Romeo, you know, but whatever. <laughs> OK, look, it's, it's fantastic to have you here. I think, you're, again, congratulations to you. Congratulations to your students. This is a really exciting time. One, of the, one other thing I need to mention before we go is that um, you know, we've been implementing this strategy over the last couple of years. I've talked about crossing boundaries. Something else we did was to completely restructure our career centre. Right? Um, not that there's anything particularly wrong with the career centre when I arrived, but I just wanted to make sure that it really was the best. Right? This is one of the best universities in the world. This university has had 24 Nobel Prize winners, right? Which is about 10 less than Russia, right? Put that in perspective, seriously. Um, it's an outstanding university, outstanding business school. As I said, we have uh, outstanding students, and therefore we ought to be uh, providing an outstanding career service and placement to our students. Um, and you deserve that. Uh, and so we did bring in, in fact, we brought in Boston Consulting Group, um, to do a deep dive analysis of our career centre. And we completely restructured it. We thought about, you know, we compared what other schools were doing, um, what best practice was in some sense, what other schools were not doing that we could do that would be out of the box thinking, different type of thinking. Um, and as a result of that, we restructured the career centre, put extra headcount in there. And I'm confident that we do have one of the best, if not the best, uh, business schools career centres in the world as a, as a result of that because... We looked hard. We had one of the top consultants in the world look at it, and we put resources into develop that. We were de de delighted to be able to attract Jen Witten uh, uh, last year to, to head up that career service, and she'll be talking to you about that important aspect. And it's important that your students do start uh, engaging with the career centre uh, day one, day two, right? Get in there and start thinking about developing their personal brand, what they would like to do in life. Um, and that may change over time, but nevertheless, having a, their devoted advisor, which they have now, they can talk about that with, think about what industries they'd like to go into uh, from the beginning, developing those soft skills so that in four years' time, uh, three years' time, uh, when they are placed on the job market, they will be amongst the best in the world, which they are by capability, but they will be seen to be amongst the best in the world as well. OK, I'll be seeing um, more of you uh, going forward. Congratulations, welcome, welcome to your students. I look forward to working with you over the next few years. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Dean Taylor. Uh, really appreciate you coming in and sharing your thoughts with us this morning as he's off to his next of probably another 12 events today. Um, again, as I said, my name is Steve Malter. I have been with Ola Naum in my 16th year. Um, I know we were talking a little earlier. How, how do you, when do you stop saying how many years you've been at an organization? But I think it's 20, so I'm still allowed to count. Uh, I've been working with the undergraduate program my entire time and uh, would love to introduce, and my colleague introduce herself because uh, we we'll partner together in leading the undergraduate program. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Paige LaRose. I'm an associate dean and director of the undergraduate program. I'm in my 12th year at WashU, all of which I've worked with undergraduate business students. So our goal this morning is just to give you a quick overview of some of the things your students will be experiencing and some of the ways we want to partner with you. Um, I found this cartoon about six or seven years ago, um, and I really like it. So humor me, just a different set of emotions. <laughs> 
how many of you, this is your first student going off to college by a show of hands? Okay, this is the nervous group. How many of you, it's the last student going off to college? See the big smiles on their faces. So we will work with you together as, as we go on these next four years and beyond, but uh, certainly, as the Chancellor said last night, it's, it's been a very emotional couple of days, I'm sure, and will continue to be emotional. Hopefully your students slept last night. That will make today a lot better. <laughs> Well, another emotional and celebratory day um, is this date right here, Friday, May 19th, 2023. So for those of you who are planners or those of you I know there's at least one with a twin who's other twin is going to school elsewhere, might want to plan ahead. Um, graduation day for class of 2023. And believe it or not, we do actually have a hotel upstairs in the Knight Center, so if you call early, you might actually get to stay on campus. <laughs> uh, a little bit closer here, let's, let's move back into the immediate future. Uh, we have our Parent and Family Weekend university-wide November 1st and 2nd this year. And so we will be hosting a Dean's meeting on Friday, November 1st in the afternoon, and we would love to um, see you all there and uh, get a chance to check in on where your students are about two-thirds of the way through the semester. So this morning you get to hear from Steve and myself, uh, but there's another large contingency here that I'd definitely like to highlight. Um, our fellow undergraduate programs team members, would you guys all mind standing? I'm going to introduce them quickly at the end of our comments and Q&A as well. Uh, the advising team will be standing around out here. I encourage you to say a quick hello um, so that hopefully your student will mention that they've met with someone in our office and had a great conversation. Um, but our team that's here today, Annalisa Ortiz, Sandra Phileas, Liz Shabani, Yoon Groves, Sarah Stratton, Alana Green, Rayma Easley, Jesse Vossler, and Connie Henning. So, yeah. Yeah. so now that we've introduced the undergraduate programs team, I think I want to spend just a few minutes about, you know, follow up on what the dean said, as many of you, you visited places around the country. Um, here at Washington University, and particularly at Olin, our students matter. And we are actively engaged with our students. As many of you know, we, we reached out to them right around June 1st, June 2nd. I can't remember if it was a weekend. We've all been Skyping with them or FaceTiming with them or emailing with those that didn't have technology available. And as four-year advisors, we're actively engaged in their educational career. We want to get to know your students by name and story. You heard the chancellor and the vice chancellor talk about this last night. That really is the unofficial motto of Washington University, is knowing your student by name and story. And that's one of the benefits of the Olin community, being under 160 entering first year students. This is not just a four year experience, this is a lifetime experience. And one of the things that Paige and I enjoy, and the rest of the team enjoy, is the 10 or 15 or 20 advising appointments we do every year for alums. And the letters of recommendation and the connections, and we were both in New York and Chicago this summer visiting with alums. I think Yoon went up to something in New York City. So we say actively engage. So we're going to encourage you to have your students engage with us. We will each be reaching out to them and setting up co group coffees or dinners or lunches. The more we get to know your student, the more effective of an advocate we can be. So I certainly would encourage you to do that. Um, I also would encourage you to um, you know, Vice Chancellor White talked about that letter last night, you know, the letter from the student about breaking the leg as they jumped off the balcony from the fire, or the 45-year-old significant other, or just to put everything in context for her grades first semester. I would encourage you to help remember the context as we go through the semester. Some of your students will find things very, very easy. Others will find classes very, very difficult. What I am going to encourage you to do is to empower your student. If your student says to you, I am struggling in this class, have them reach out to the faculty member, encourage them to reach out to their advisor. We have tutoring here at the Oldham Business School. Encourage them to take advantage of that, but really put their education in their hands. I also want to encourage you, they'll come out of an assignment and they'll call you right away and say, I absolutely failed this test. 
they move on within like four and a half minutes, but forget to tell you they've moved on. <laughs> I get it, and then we all work ourselves up. Um, so close the loop and really push your students to begin to advocate for themselves. And you're gonna hear a lot of what the dean talked about in your student experience. You know, Monday morning, we're gonna have the first academic lecture and highlight one of our four pillars, which is values-based data-driven. We are a highly entrepreneurial school and an entrepreneurial mindset, and they're gonna go be a part of the innovation community on Monday and Tuesday for orientation. We are very, very experiential, and we'll talk about our classes in a minute, and we are highly global, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. And so you're gonna hear those four pillars coming from your students throughout. So they do have two, in case they haven't told you, they have two business classes this fall. Um, and that's all they can take. And I'm gonna talk about Management 100 very briefly, and then Paige will talk about the class she leads. Um, and this is with Professor Kiosus. They are in groups, they're in cohorts of about 40, 42, depending mm -hmm. on the schedule. And with those 42 people, they'll be in both their business school classes. Um, and they will be a part of one team throughout the semester, but they are two separate classes. So Management 100, they're gonna introduce the students to firms and markets. They're going to introduce them to strategy, incentives, tensions, that values-based, data-driven. And then they're gonna introduce them to um, uh, corporate social responsibility. When we talk about being highly experiential here, their big deliverable, you will hear this word for the next four years, is case comp or case competition. About halfway through the semester, they will receive an organization that they have to solve a problem for. I think last year, was it Disney last year? That was in the spring. In the spring. So it would be Disney. How do they, how do they keep growing? Yeah. Uh, we looked at a few years ago, how does Barnes & Noble stay competitive? Obviously, not so well. Uh, how, does toy, how does Toys R Us toys transform? Us, yeah. But they're back, if you haven't read the article. Um, and what we do is we give our students very little information, and that's the question. And they then spend weeks with their group reading, examining, thinking through how strategy can play out, and making recommendations. And I will tell you, it must be eight or nine years ago now, or maybe not even that long ago, six years ago when we did Target, right after the data breach, our first year students had the same recommendations that the Target CEO later took about pulling out of Canada, pulling out of other places and focusing on strategy. And we believe in immersing your students in real world problems. And so they're gonna get that highly experiential learning starting in their first semester in Management 100, but also in the next course they'll be taking. Right, so the companion course is Management 150. The course is led by myself on Tuesdays, and Yoon Groves leads the Thursday sections. And it's a really unique opportunity in the sense that the first year students also have the opportunity every week to hear from our senior most faculty members. And our senior faculties will come in each week and lead a lecture on their area of research. So they'll hear from our economics faculty, Anne Marie Nutt in strategy, a supply chain faculty member, Dean Milborn for finance, and so on and so forth, so that all of our areas in the business school are covered conveniently. It's pretty much also all of the majors that we offer. So they get sort of an early sense of, I really enjoyed that lecture on marketing, that lecture on accounting, not so much. And so whatever their interests might be, we encourage them to think about and reflect upon um, what they heard from our faculty members in that first semester so they can begin to explore with their four-year advisor what they might be interested in studying. Also, when our faculty come in, they lead, um, again, a lecture about their academic area, which we ask our students to then apply to the deliverable for the course. And the course is pretty unique. We take an entrepreneurial lens and ask students to work in these same teams that Dean Malter mentioned for 100. And they are asked and challenged to develop a, a consumer retail product um, throughout the course of the semester. So they take these concepts from supply chain and finance and marketing and so on, um, apply them to their uh, product, and in the end of the semester, we'll submit a final business plan to us. One thing that I've learned over my several years um, teaching and leading this course is what problems our, our freshmen face in college, which are they can't get up on time without waking their roommate up, they have trouble with laundry, and their backpacks are either too heavy or not cool enough for them. Um, so we get a lot of those products, but also a lot of really cool ideas as well. I think one of my favorite ones from last year was um, a group of students who had an idea 
for um, cool bedding and wall decor um, for children who might be uh, hospitalized for terminal illnesses. So students really um, get very creative, um, have a social impact twist to their product products, or again, solve a simple problem like their backpack being too heavy or their coffee not staying hot enough, long enough. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a couple years ago, we actually had a group of students that did one on uh, bringing musicians together to help them find groups if a band needs a, a guitarist or, or whatever and exposing uh, musicians' music to the population. They're now in their fourth year of business, and they just sent me an email. They went ahead and did this. They're, they're getting, they need interns. How can we get interns? We need to send it on to the Career Center. They're meeting with venture capitalists. So some of these ideas are really impactful, and we encourage the students, if they're interested, to, to take it forward. And so we're really excited about that. In addition to what Dean LaRose said about research, and to, to follow up with what Dean Taylor said, creating knowledge is a, is a central pillar of our, our school. And it's really important that your students are learning the cutting edge information as our faculty are researching it. Your students will be exposed to faculty research Tuesday? Yes. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon, afternoon. okay. Uh, we're gonna have all your students in here. We're gonna do a TED Talk style uh, research symposium with three of our faculty. So it'll be a really good chance early on to have your students understand what research is and how they might be involved in it. Because our faculty are always looking for uh, research assistance and we all, they always love talking to students about their research. We're pretty excited about that. So as I mentioned in his intro, uh, the dean came from the UK and believes in a very highly global experience. Um, our first meeting, he and I met around November 30th of, of 2016, and he asked me, how many of your students go abroad? And I said, we're about 60%. He said, are you happy? I said, well, I'd love to get to 75%. And he said, good, we're agreed 100%. <laughs> so. Uh, we are hoping that every single one of your students will engage in some global program in their four years. Uh, it very well may be a degree requirement by the class of 2025, and we're seeing our numbers increase. But traditionally, study abroad is done during the junior year, but that's not how it works here. We have three, we have multiple, multiple programs that your students could engage in as early as next summer. We have the Israel Summer Business Academy, which um, I am a faculty member in, six weeks in Tel Aviv, learning about Israel and innovation, meeting leaders of startups, creating their own startup. We had 72 students with us last summer. We're hoping to grow it a little bit this summer. We had um, about 14 students do entrepreneurship and startups in the EU, doing a comparison between uh, Madrid and Sarajevo and how sort of new Europe and old Europe works in the entrepreneurial world and then they had an applied research project and then we have a new uh, European capitals of culture in London and Galloway looking at sort of the intersection of culture and arts uh, in the business of arts is one of our new minors so we will be talking to your students in their management 150 class in a couple of weeks about this and the applications will open this fall but we encourage your students if they're looking for something meaningful to do next semester these are all credit bearing opportunities, but it is a really good experience for underclass, underclassmen, and it's very compelling as they go talking to the recruiter in the next year about what they did after their first year and how it prepared them to take on that next step or that next internship. So I often get asked if I would characterize the WashU or Olin student body. Um, Typically, the first thing out of my mouth is they're all very bright and serious about their academics. And then the second thing I share is that they're all very involved on campus. I'll speak to your students about getting involved a little later this week, but I wanted to plant the seed with all of you as well about the importance of participating in organizations, volunteer um, community events um, during their time here at WashU. Much of you know, what they've come into right now has been chosen for them. They didn't get to select who lives on their floor, right? Even for our two business courses, Management 100 and 150, they don't even get to select who's on their team. But this is one aspect. They can choose how they spend their free time when they're not studying, when they're not on their floor, what they get involved with, who they interact with, um, and what sort of purpose and passion they fulfill by getting involved in student organizations. There are hundreds upon hundreds 
kinds of things to get involved with, ranging from athletics, intramural and club sports, to musical and performing arts endeavors, a cappella groups and orchestra, um, but also student organizations and volunteer opportunities within the St. Louis community. So please, I hope um, if I can ask a favor, maybe at the end of the first week of classes or about a month into their time here, ask them what they're, are they going to any student organization meetings? How are they meeting people outside of the classroom? And we have two opportunities coming up where that they can explore and learn about all of the different types of organizations that are on campus. The first is Thursday, August 29th. We have our Olin Activities Fair. Um, we have about 26 Olin student organizations, ranging from professional fraternities um, to career-focused groups um, and also service-oriented groups as well. And then the following day, there is a campus-wide activities fair, and there's well over 300. I think it's nearing 400 student organizations at the campus-wide level. And all of the student organizations will be outside on Mudfield, table and recruiting new members for the upcoming year. Um, so again, please do. I think um, these are great ways to connect with people, uh, develop their interests. Um, in the case of our Olin student organizations even, uh, interact with alumni. Alums who, when they were students here, participated in these student organizations and are more than willing to come back and connect with current students in those organizations. And so I just think it's a great way to develop their informal and formal leadership skills. Um, so again, my favor is to encourage you to help me do this. <laughs> and if your student is interested, I think Dean Taylor is the Beekeeping Society faculty advisor. So wow. one of our BSBAs recruited him. He also recruits actors for his Shakespearean yeah. troupe as well. Yes. We somehow managed to avoid being uh, part of the cast of Shakespeare, but uh, so who far. knows? <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> All right, well, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Witten. She's an associate dean and director of the Weston Career Center. Jennifer has been with us for a little over a year now, coming from Arizona State University, and has over 20 years uh, experience in career education. Come on up, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to Wash U, to Olin. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you about the Western Career Center and really the services that we provide and how your student will be able to engage with us through their four years, but also as an alum, because we offer services for alumni as well. And as um, Meg and Alana that are passing around, I do have some employment stats, and we have enough, I think, for at least one per family. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we go along. So I'd like to share a little bit about the Weston Career Center, who we are, which will also tell you a little bit about the services that we offer. So you might know that there's also a Wash U Career Center. So Olin affiliated students have an additional career center that they can tap into as they go throughout their time here um, at Wash U. Our services are aligned with the different teams. We have four teams that work within the Weston Career Center. The first team that we have is focused on corporate relations and business development. One of the reasons, and, and Dean Taylor mentioned this, is through BCG, is we knew that we needed to get a farther reach when it came to the Career Center. So the main function of this team is developing relationships in different geographic areas and really enhancing and developing the brand of Wash U. So we have staff that support the West Coast, the East Coast, the Midwest, as well as Asia. And again, they're going out there, talking to employers, developing new opportunities, and making sure that we're providing the opportunities that our students are truly interested in as well. Then we have our industry lead team. This is a team that's focused in on employer engagement and thinking about ways to connect what's happening in the market with what's happening here on the campus as well as what's happening in the curriculum. So they're working day in and day out with employers trying to determine what are the skills that they're looking for and how are our students competitive in that market. Not only that, they look at different opportunities to uniquely engage with employers. So an example of that is coming up in the next couple weeks, we're partnering with Deloitte to offer a Salesforce boot camp that students can participate in. It's a recruiting opportunity, but for students, it's also a learning opportunity so that they can gain skills to help them later on in their career. So they're always looking at ways to do that. They coordinate different treks where we travel across the US to visit companies and organizations. 
They work on different events, career fairs. We're doing an accounting connection. So also thinking about ways that we can be really focused in on the particular areas that our students are most interested in and creating the events and opportunities to really enhance their experience. And then we have our career coaching team. Our career coaching team, and I think this is one of the unique things that Olin does, is made up of career coaches that are dedicated to different student audiences. So just like your student will have a four-year academic advisor, they also have a four-year career coach. So I believe all of the students have received an email about who their career coach is. Um, and I do want to introduce, we've got Meg Hunt here who's handing that out. She leads our BSBA career coaching team. And when I really think about the career coaches and, and what they do, we have a particular model that we use and we use the self, the story, the strategy, and the journey. The self is about who you are, where you want to go. How are you going to articulate that story to somebody? What's your unique strategy based upon what it is that you want to do and where you want to go, and how do we help you move through that process? How do you reflect? How do you think about your career? And this is the model that we use for all the different audiences that we work with, so everyone that from the undergrad all the way through alums. So when you think about that, we want to be there to support them if they don't know what they want to be, all the way to the point that they know, I think I know what I want my first job to be to five or 10 years out. Now I want to make a change. So the career coaching is there throughout that entire time. All these other services are as well. And the fourth is our events and operations team. So they're kind of behind the scenes, making sure that we are providing a top level service for both our students and our employers. They also pay a lot of attention to the data that we collect. So one of the things that we try to do is make sure that we truly understand our students. So if you hear them talking about a system called CareerLink or they've got to update their profiles, that's from the Career Center trying to get a sense on what it is that they're interested in. And they can change at any point in time too. I think sometimes they're afraid to say, I'm interested in this now. Well, that's fine, just go in and change it. And this team helps us better understand understand what our students are really passionate about and how we can help them. Last year, this came into play when we learned that a lot of our students were interested in marketing and entertainment. We we're able to create a, a new club in partnership with the BSBA programs office. We've got a new women in finance group. So wherever we can, starting to think about what our students are interested in and how do we collaborate with others. They're behind the scenes collect, kind of collecting that, that data. We're also getting to know the students because we're able to have the dedicated career coaches for them as well. So that kind of gives you an idea of the Weston Career Center. Um, as Dean Taylor mentioned, it was recently restructured, and we've added additional headcount. We've also added additional uh, staff to be able to support the students and their unique needs. So some of the outcomes, I always feel like particularly parents want to know, you know, what are the outcomes? What are some of the return on the investment that occur? I'm, I'm really proud of the BSBA career outcomes. On average, about 97% of our students are employed. Um, and this is pretty steady over the last, I think, five or six years. I think I've indicated almost a decade now. Um, so it's pretty consistent that they're, they're employed, they're in high demand. I will actually say from, from our position, we actually have more employers that probably want more of our BSBA students than we have BSBA students to fulfill those needs. That's actually a challenge that we have because of the high quality. They're very dedicated, they have great initiative, and they are very engaged and involved, which are all characteristics that employers look for. You'll see the, the salary for the class of 2018 was 68,000. We're still in the process of collecting all of our data for the past class, but right now the 2019 data is trending around 75,000, so we have seen an increase over this last year, with the signing bonus still around $10,000. So what you'll see too um, in the employment stats, it does break it down by different industries and functions as well as geographic areas. So you will see if you have some, if you want to dig in a little bit more and figure out, I know sometimes people ask me where do they go? They go all over the US, our students do. Um, hence the other reasons why we've also developed um, from the Career Center, staff that are supporting different geographic regions so that we can also connect with students, interns, and alums. You'll also see the breakdown of the different functions. And I'm happy to, at the Q&A, if you've got additional questions, happy to answer those as well. 
I did want to share with you, though, and you'll see a list of employers. I think it's quite impressive. I know you'll see that we do have a lot of financial services and consulting firms that our students will work with, but I wanted to share kind of this just image that lets you know that we work with a wide variety of companies and organizations, everything from large companies to smaller to midsize, to be able to help people find where it is that they are going to fit in with an organization. Some of these companies come onto campus. We're seeing a lot more companies using virtual recruiting. We actually have a full room set up in our career center that is completely designed for virtual recruiting with a nice wash U background so that the students feel very professional. We recently had a student get a, do that and he got a job and he said that the employer, your office is so nice. So he felt very comfortable. Um, so again, all those little small things that we can do to help them be successful in that process. But just you can see by the variety of companies that we work with, I think it's quite impressive. And again, helping your student find what fits best for them is really what we love to do and is um, something we're looking forward to meeting with them very soon. We'll be spending some time with them over the next week, getting to know them and getting them to think a little bit about what's most important to them and how that relates to their particular career. So I think I'm moving on to the, to the next part of the agenda. So that's it for our prepared remarks. Before we break up and give you a chance to meet with your student's academic advisor, we would love to take questions, answer any questions you have. We have a couple microphones that'll be running around. Uh, remember, your students aren't here to give you a dirty look or roll their eyes if you have a question. So we would invite the opportunity, because if you've got the question, there's at least two dozen parents in the room with probably the same exact question history tells us. Okay, we got one down here, Alana. Kick us off. Oh. No, right here, behind you. <laughs> it might be too specific, but um, we have an athlete, and I heard about your um, international programs and internships, and I'm wondering if athletes are able to participate in those. So on the international internship or internship no, and both, both. Okay. Well, we have international internships. That's oh. why I clarified. Okay. That too. Um, so uh, our athletes, and it depends what sport, and we have, we have about 9% varsity athletes. Did I? In this incoming, in incoming class, class, it's 9%. 9%, so you're not alone. Um, so depending on your sport, whether it's a fall sport, a spring sport, or both, um, but students have the opportunity, they can study abroad in the fall, they can study abroad in the summer. If there are, if there are fall and spring student, again, that's why we have the summer programs, that's why we have the May programs. But those that have their summer free, absolutely. About 99% of our graduating class every year engages in an internship. So being an athlete will not impact their ability to fully experience both global and uh, internship opportunities. Can we got one here? I think we're recording it, so I've been asked to have uh, folks use the mic if you don't okay. mind. So just speaking. Is ready? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask you how early they should apply for the summer programs and if there's problems on availability. Um, and also uh, about research, how, how difficult it is for a first year student to get research. Okay. For the summer programs, when does the summer study abroad application open? <laughs> November. Uh, we have a pretty, we have, I mean, these programs are competitive. I'm not going to uh, tell you everyone who applies gets on it, but we have built pretty good bandwidth for students to do, uh, engage. And do you want to talk about research, Paige? Sure. So research opportunities can occur in a couple of ways. Um, just organically, uh, your student may chat with a professor after class one day. I really enjoyed this aspect. Can you tell me more about your research? And the professor opens up, oh, I, I'm looking for some assistance with this. Um, but we also have opportunities to engage in independent research sponsored by a faculty member. And a student can get business elective credit for conducting that kind of research. Um, our international internship programs all have a requirement of an applied research project within them. And then finally, we have a program in the senior year. It's called Honors and Management. Stud it's a year-long research program. Uh, students learn from faculty in the fall semester about their research and various research models that can be used. 
they form teams and beginning at the end of the fall semester and then throughout the spring semester conduct their own research guided by the faculty member. Um, and then the honors and management program means that they graduate with honors. And your students as part of Management 100 will be participants in research studies. Oh, and that's a requirement that. in many of our classes. So it might be a marketing, a consumer behavior, a negotiation study. So they'll have the opportunities to be research subjects as well. Okay, where's our next question? What, Rayma? Or, okay, we got one in the back. You said you had a 97% uh, employment rate. I'm wondering uh, what the other 3% is. Uh, and I'm, I'm, it's a kind of a twofold question because I'm wondering if they go directly to grad school and that's what prevents the other 3%. And what's Olin's thought process on direct to graduate school versus uh, employment first? You want to do the first part now? Well, I can add, yeah, and you can add your, your yeah. thoughts. So that number of 97 actually only includes students that were actively seeking a job. So there's about 10% of our student audience that will go on to graduate school that's not included in that number. The 3%, that is a common question. I think some of the things that we will find, you know, it could be a student that has a very particular area of interest or they want to move to a different geographic area. That particular industry doesn't hire until later. And then we do have some students that maybe didn't engage as early as they should have. So it's a very small number, but maybe they hadn't had the time to come into their career center for other reasons. So the earlier that they engage, I think the more that we can help that 3% as well. And as far as right to graduate school, I think we have like nine specialized master's programs right now. So students can do kind of a 3-2, so their last two years get a graduate degree. And those are pre-experience type programs. Many of our students do go on to graduate school later on and they will go for their MBA, but the average MBA has about four to five years work experience. So they, just because they go right into the workforce doesn't mean they won't go back for something. And then we always have students going to law school, Lost to veterinary school, yeah. dental med school, school, med school. So again, this is all very highly individualized based on what your students' interests are. You want to pick? Where's our microphones? Are they? Yeah. Uh, yes, you might have mentioned that um, the study abroad or the summer internships, uh, those are not all the internships. Uh, so can you give examples of some of the other internships? And also the other question is uh, the percentage of uh, freshmen or after first year that can actually get into such programs. Uh, you know, so first year students interning, do you know how, how many do it? We don't really have the, the data at this point on how many first years would do internships. I think many of them will, it's more common after their sophomore year. Some of them will participate in other things um, like the study abroad after their first year. Um, but that would be the most common. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's starting sophomore, the most common junior to senior mm -hmm. would be. And some of our first year students will go back to summer jobs or if they've been a part, part of work, camp, yeah. mm -hmm. part time work, they'll study abroad. I think very few of our first years have a true internship. They don't have the skill set and depth of knowledge in business yet to go take on one of these more sophisticated internships. The firms just aren't really calling for that level of talent. Yeah. Thank you so much, first of all, for this entire experience, which is great. Um, how popular is the economics major in the School of Arts and Sciences? And can you comment on sort of the relationships between not just the academic departments, but the kids who are arts and sciences economics majors and the business school kids? Great question. Um, <laughs> so I'd say they're very different majors. Um, the arts and sciences economics major tends to be much more theoretical. Um, ours is very much an applied economics um, sort of learning that goes on within the economics and strategy major in the business school. Um, in my 12 years here, uh, there have been, say, a handful of our Olin students um, that have pursued a second major or minor in economics in arts and sciences. I wouldn't say it's overwhelmingly popular, though. 
Um, if you flip that, there are economics majors and arts and sciences uh, that pursue some sort of second major or minor with us here in the business school. I'd say that's more common than our Olin students getting a second major or minor in the School of Arts and Sciences in economics specifically. Did that answer your question? Paige is very diplomatic. So, it, it answered about halfway. Look, I went to a school that only had an economics, mm -hmm. you know, major, and it's net today. It's Dartmouth today. About forty percent of the Dartmouth students major in economics, which is a problem. Oh, wow. But they all are pursuing the same internships. They're all pursuing the same research. They're all trying to apply at BCG and Google. And I was just wondering what, how popular the economics major is there, and. I understand Olin is collaborative, but is there like competition between these kids or not really? I honestly can't speak to the size of the arts and sciences economics department. I, I know it's reasonably popular, but I can't tell you. I mean, it's not pre-med. I'll tell you that much with the numbers. Um, I believe some of our faculty do, when we have research symposiums, their faculty are invited. We had some kind of econ symposium this summer, and I saw a bunch of their faculty there. I don't know how much goes on as far as Jen. I don't know if you have any thoughts on the overlap on sort of the employment. We definitely, we collaborate, uh, collaborate a lot with the Wash U Career Center and arts and sciences students and business students can apply for the same opportunities on campus. So there definitely is some of that competition, but I always go back to the thought that we know that employers are looking to hire more and more of our students. So it is a really positive, I feel like, experience for both employers and students. Um, and I would say for some of the consulting companies are um, about 50% of their hires are typically coming from Olin specifically, and the other 50% might be coming from other areas throughout the campus. Thank you. Okay. Questions? We go in the middle here. Yeah, I thank thank you for the session. This is very educational for 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 me personally, and I'm hoping for other other parents here too. Uh, Easy some of the nerves, you know, coming in and as kids come, you know, start our. Uh, yesterday was very stressful, you know, for some of us. Um, well, so the heat, the heat didn't help either. So. Uh, so with that, the question I have is couple fold. One, um, I'm hearing BSBA mentioned multiple times, you know, as we went through. Um, I've heard about BBA, you know, as the other other degree, you know, as, as as people as the kids graduate. So I was wondering whether our kids here are going to get BBA or BSBA. So what's the difference, and what are kids going to get? And the second follow-up question I have is I'm hearing through some of the other kids that they are coming for a business degree and a computer science degree. Uh, it's something we were not aware of uh, as we were coming in for our kid. And she is doing a plain business degree. So is there, if she is, and again, it's up to her if she's interested, is there an option for her to switch or not switch in during these four years? Okay, you, you, yeah, you, you asked very good questions, and the answer we would have given you last year is different than this year's with some innovation, so. Sure, so for the majority of the families in here, your students, um, a hun what's the math on this, Annalisa, 141? Thank you. <laughs> 141 of your students, um, we only offer the BSBA degree, Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, um, which means there are a certain set of degree requirements for this BSBA class of 2023 that they have to achieve in order to graduate on May 19th, 2023. There are a subset of you in here, um, 16, who are prime business, or potentially 14 who are prime engineering, whose students were admitted to a brand new joint program, which is a, a joint program, a Bachelor of Science in Business and Computer Science. It is a distinct degree that those 30 students, brand new, are the first ever that can earn this degree. So that could sort of explain, and I think we have a tendency maybe to talk about BSBAs because that's traditionally only been what we offered. 
Um, there is, however, and I think you asked this in your question, an opportunity. Um, students may apply to transfer. So if your student chose um, to enter into Olin for the BSBA degree, um, there is an opportunity to transfer into the joint program in business and computer science. Um, that opportunity would be available in the spring semester. Um, it will be a competitive, it's a very small program, um, so it will be a competitive process, but the opportunity to transfer does exist. But I will add to that, your student can be a BSBA and have a second major or minor in computer science without being in the joint program. So those are still very achievable if the joint program isn't for them or if we don't have the ability to have as many people that are interested in it. I think you've got a microphone over here, so. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my son is doing the business uh, program and is minoring in computer science. So yes, it's very doable. Um, you had mentioned earlier that there are two classes that they're taking in the first semester. How many classes are they taking in the second semester? And how does it intensify over the four years, the uh, courses uh, business? Yeah, so the business coursework, the sequence as we progress into the spring semester, um, we really want uh, all of them to be taking microeconomics in the business school as well as the first semester of uh, business statistics. There is an option to take a third course in the spring semester, uh, which is financial accounting. Um, it's a conversation your student will have with their four-year advisor as to whether it makes sense and it fits in. Um, that sequence then progresses fall semester of their sophomore year. All of our degree students should be taking management communication, um, which our management communication team collaborates with the Weston Career Center. It's very uh, communications and career development focused course. And they would also take uh, business statistics too in that fall semester of the sophomore year. At that time, we would begin to have individual conversations with the students about what their major interests are, what their ultimate goals are, are they combining studies in other schools to figure out whether it makes sense. We would probably most likely encourage a third business course fall semester of sophomore year, but it could be four, maybe even five, depending on what their goals are. Um, I think this is really important uh, for you to encourage your student, again, to speak with their four-year advisor so we can have these rich conversations about what their goals are and, and how can we work with them to try to fit everything in, if it's possible, before graduation. And, and I know I spoke about getting to know your four-year advisor. We actually mandate they have to meet with their advisor or they can't register for the following semester. So if your student isn't actively engaged, we sort of have the, the carrot and stick approach. So, All right, do we, do we see one in the back? Who's got the microphone? Yes, with the microphone, please. Hello. Yeah. So really appreciate to, uh, like, in basically enlighten us that what kind of support system the business school has for the students, uh, that's kind of comforting. Uh, but I have kind of a specific question in light of that joint program, computer science and business, uh, where my kid is actually enrolled in. Uh, <clears throat> primarily, it's the uh, umbrella of the engineering school. So I think he has advisor from the engineering school, but how it's going to mix from the advising in terms of the business school faculty, one. And the last question I have is, you mentioned that this program is kind of a brand new. Mm -hmm. Is it in its first year or it's kind of uh, already mature enough to have uh, the comfort of the program to sustain and have a future plan already designed. All right, so the first, I'll do the second. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, honestly, it's really a systems issue. Um, we're sort of working within a framework for these joint program students. And in developing the program, it was agreed upon between Olin and McKelvey. Um, roughly half of the students would be prime in Olin and half would be prime in engineering. 
We on our team have one designated person who is the advisor for the Business Prime Joint Program students. McKelvey did the same. Uh, Ron Lowey is his name and Jesse Vossler here is our prime contact. Ron and Jesse have been communicating and coordinating very closely all summer um, to really work hard to ensure that these students in this special joint cohort have a very similar experience with regards to both advising, their academics, and their co-curricular opportunities. Um, we did, in the joint program, uh, they had the idea and created a one-credit seminar that all 30 of these students, no matter who they're prime with, will all be together once a week in this seminar throughout the fall semester. And we really do hope um, the intention is to work with them to understand they're a special cohort um, with different requirements. And though they might have two advisors, they are collaborating quite closely. And I was, this is a brand new program. We admitted some students last spring, but this is our first entering class. I was part of the design team. So as the McKelvey reps and the Olin reps went, we, we met with lots of people both in higher ed, but more importantly in career services, the, the companies. And when we spoke to each of the companies about this concept and we reviewed the uh, academics, the responses I got are, how many can we have and when are they ready? And so we, but we know that there's some great demand right now. It's certainly in the marketplace from Google, from Facebook, from the consulting firms that this is going to be a, a really nice program that will have great outcomes. OK, where's the next one? We've got one down here. Hi, thank you for all the info and stuff. Uh, my son, he, he is very interested to all in business school, but he hasn't decided yet, so now he's undecided. My question is, uh, what's the difference is uh, like uh, he decided later on to join Orlin, and even maybe he uh, decided one on the other school and transferred to Orlin, and uh, if he decided now already. Okay. okay, so there is an opportunity for all students on campus to transfer between academic divisions. The university does have a policy that you must sit in, this, in the school that admitted you for a full semester before you are able to transfer to another academic division. So what that means is a student could apply in the fall semester to transfer into one of the other schools. Um, I would definitely encourage the student to meet with the four-year advisor in their current home school, as well as drop in and have some advising done in the school that they're interested or schools that they're interested in transferring into. Our requirements at Olin have changed this year. Um, in order to transfer into Olin, a student must have a 3.5 GPA and have completed two business courses along with Calculus 2. Um, the reality is a student would not likely be able to transfer into Olin until the sophomore year. Um, so our requirements have changed um, for interest in transferring into the other schools. I would definitely recommend the student, again, meet with their advisors or check the website for their requirements. It's a decided ASAP, I guess. Um, no, actually, the decision is not an ASAP decision. Okay. I would say the decision is really more of a get settled into classes, start talking to upperclassmen, advisors on campus, and perhaps come and talk to one of the BSBA advisors in like October. Um, it's not an ASAP decision, though. Got you. Thank you. And uh, also, all the orientation on uh, the coming week, it's uh, for all the students, mm -hmm. say, um, like the speech um, will be given um, tomorrow and the day after will be to all the students or only for the all-in students? Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you have a, an older child that has gone to school here, but uh, WashU has completely revamped the orientation this year. Um, so it's much different than in the past if anyone here has um, older students that have gone through WashU. Um, students have moved in on um, Saturday. There's a lot of um, parent involvement and family involvement today. Uh, beginning tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, students will go to orientation programming sponsored by their home academic school. So the BSBA and joint program students uh, will be with us here at Olin for most of their, uh, all of their academic programming. 
Um, and then beginning on Thursday, uh, the Division of Student Affairs is offering immersive experiences for the students. So academics are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is other programming offered by the Division of Student Affairs. But if your student's you. an art science student, he or she needs to attend art science orientation. Yes. Only Olin students and joint students are allowed to participate in the Olin orientation over the next three days. All right, I think we have one in the back, and if you don't mind passing that down after. Go ahead, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the um, helpful information, and um, we really appreciate it. Um, two questions. The first question is, you talked about study abroad briefly, uh, about the program in Tel Aviv, for example, in the summer. Mm -hmm. How does it work if, let's say, they do want to do the junior year abroad or the semester? Do you work with them initially when they meet with you in freshman year to say, OK, well, these are the courses you have to take in order to be able to do that overseas trip, or you should do it in the summer. So do you work with them at the start? And then the second question is on the Career Center. Um, if they want to pursue maybe a different geographic location for the summers, for example, closer to home, do you enable them um, to go ahead and seek out that's you know beyond some of those different places that you normally do you help them work with alumni in those areas? I, mean, I think for the global programs, just because you go in the summer, we would love students to still do the full semester abroad in the junior year. And going abroad for a full semester will not delay graduation rate. Or if you do a summer and a full semester, we've even had students do a year abroad. It's a little bit trickier, and the advisor will work individually to make sure we can get the right classes. So that's not going to be a problem. And this program, the summer in Israel, is open to anyone, regardless of what they're studying. So we'll have art students, psychology majors, engineers. So the coursework your student will be having this year will prepare him or her in order to do that. And then I'll let Jen comment about the summer opportunities geographically. I might interject. Um, I think part of your question was when do they need to start planning for it? I would absolutely recommend they mention it to their four-year advisor that this is a goal of theirs. Um, really more serious conversation should start sophomore year about the semester-long study abroad experience. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, yes. We'll help them, you know, regardless of whatever geographic area that they want to target. If they're working with their career coach, they just let them know that. And either if it is networks that we have or part of the alumni network here, and I know some of in the audience are alums, is incredibly strong and very interested in helping students. So yes, we will help them. And down here. A uh, quick question about their uh, AP and IB scores, if they have enough uh, credits to shave off a semester, would you recommend that they, during their second year, take an internship during the school year? And how would that affect their academic, um, you know, whatever course load that they're taking? I'll speak to the AP and IB first, and then I'll let you comment on that taking a semester off. Um, so WashU, we have a policy. Uh, a student can bring in a maximum of 15 pre-matriculation credits, which is a full semester. Um, so uh, you know, it, it can plot out, again, work with the four-year advisor how uh, much that might progress a student towards graduating early or having an ability to take a leave of absence for a semester. And I would say that the inter that really depends upon what they're interested in, the industry, the companies, the organizations, because some only have summer un internships. If they want to stay here in St. Louis and do something, that's a little bit different. So I think it really depends on what it is that they're trying to pursue. There are some opportunities that are six-month internships. So for example, one, we have a student doing a Disney Imagineering internship. That is six months. Fits right in with her goals. Makes a lot of sense. But it's going to be really depending upon what, what they want to achieve. Back here on the. Do you offer the uh, six month or it's the uh, winter break uh, travel abroad opportunities? And do you recommend that for the freshman year or holding off? So we have one mixed program doing startup consulting in Tel Aviv in January, but it is not open to first year students because they just, again, don't have the skills in the um, academic depth. Traditionally, it's sophomore, junior, or senior year that students would do that. So, do you have the microphone? Can we? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And then we'll go back to you after. So the question I had was, uh, are there any prerequisites that the kids can take so that it can help them with their courses? Like uh, I know the dean mentioned that we're very focused from data 
oriented. So maybe it's something to do with machine learning or artificial intelligence or something that they can do that can help them with their courses. Are there any prerequisites or anything that you would recommend for the kids to take? So it's a, um, you know, the sequence of our degree, um, as students progress in coursework, many of our upper level courses do have prerequisites associated with them. Um, you know, for the most part, it's somewhat lock and step, at least as far as those prerequisite courses. I guess I'm not entirely certain of your question. Um, I, I mean, I think if you're asking, is there other opportunities like outside of Olin in the summer, for example? We have some policies around summer transfer credits. Um, you know, again, I think it'd be a conversation with the four-year advisor. I mean, I think there are some online resources if your student doesn't know Excel at all. I highly recommend if there's like yeah. a Khan Academy or something like that, that's something, but really everything we do is contained within our coursework. Did you get the microphone? Okay. Yes, hi, thank you for this morning. Can you talk please about the 3-2 program? What percentage of your students go on to do that here at Olin and how does that impact, impact internships and study abroad opportunities? Okay, so the 3-2 is specialized master's programs. It's, I don't have an exact percentage, it's a fair number of students. We have masters in accounting, we have masters in corporate finance, quantitative finance, we have five analytics, masters of analytics, and we have a masters of supply chain. Um, so it's a fair bit of students that'll do that, and that's a conversation you want to start having sophomore year with your advisor, junior fall, and we'll bring them over to meet with the graduate advising team as well. Um, we do have a 3-2 MBA program, but that is incredibly small because, again, the average student has five years work experience, so we're talking onesies, twosies. Um, but uh, I think it also depends on what your student's interested in. And that's where this is all very individualized because it's not right for every student and it may be great for a certain field. So I don't know if you want to talk about how it impacts the internship, the 3-2. I think it, it's very similar. It depends upon what they would like to do and how they want to spend their time. And it is a handful of students and we would work with them based upon what their interests are. I don't, I don't see a lot difference between those that do the 3-2 and somebody you know, tr pursuing anything. It's just coming to talk to us about what they would like to do and at what point in time. Time for a couple more and then is there another one or two and then we can go ahead and we've exhausted you all. <laughs> all right, well, on, on behalf of my colleagues, our faculty, the dean, welcome to Olin and we'll be happy to say hello out, outside in the forum or in here. Yeah, outside would be outside more, for much Thank cozier. you so much for your time this morning. <laughs> <laughs>